this something you learned when you were born an entrepreneur? You got to start small. I have not allowed being a woman to hold me back. Credibility is not just making money, it's about making sure that you know people trust what you're doing. Law practice is not only about going to court, it's about advice. It's very difficult to, to hire somebody who's not motivated and then make them motivated. One of the things that I'm known for is integrity. They have to see you as a person of integrity. <laughs> Welcome to the Executive Lounge. I'm Inshira Adi. Welcome to the Executive Lounge with me, Inshira Ado. This is the business leadership program that brings you nuggets of insights uh, from men and women who have scaled the daunting heights of growing, managing, and expanding businesses across different sectors in Ghana. Today we're joined by a man who is very well known in the banking sector. Uh, you could call him an astute banker and a quintessential gentleman. He is the CEO of Stambic Bank Ghana. Mr. Alhassan Andani, welcome to the Executive Lab. Thank you very much, sir. Great. Thanks for being here. Now, quite a lot of the time, um, people tend to remember you be for your prowess and uh, achievement in the banking sector. But we tend not to know much about you. <laughs> so let's go back to soon after 1960. <laughs> well, uh, so 1960, that's my year of birth and um, grew up in quite a large family. Uh, so I come from a traditional uh, home in Dagbong where we are blessed to have the kingship. So my father was a chief. Okay. And um, the story of uh, the Gomba chief says they have the privilege of being the um, repository of the, <laughs> the gene pool. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I grew up in a very large compound with wow. brothers and sisters and um, I started, I, I started off um, school in um, Sanergu. That time we had moved. And again, the bomb, you can move from one skin to another. Mm -hmm. So we moved from Bamvam to, to Sanergu, where I started secondary school, primary school, in the Sanergu Anglican primary. So I started as an Anglican trained. You know, so um, yes, and then went on uh, to the Nyohane Middle School. And uh, then to 1972, 73, I wrote a common entrance and went into Ghana College, where you know I schooled with um, very great men. I'm sure you know all of them. Ghana College is one of the best schools in Ga Ghana, one of the Nkuma schools. Okay. And then uh, went on, I finished Form Five in 1978, and then went on to. Um, Tamil Secondary School, where I did my SIS form uh, between 1978 1980, and then on to the University of Ghana in 1980 to do my BSc degree in agriculture. Yeah, yeah so that's cool. Uh, so 1983 was supposed to be graduating, but those were the heady days of mm -hmm. uh, Jerry Rawlings, and we, we spent one year out, so we got back in 1984 to graduate. So I graduated from the University of Ghana in 1984, and then uh, went on to do. Uh, my national service with SSB Bank, uh, where I was with the Development Finance Division. And for me, essentially, it was a continuation of schooling uh, at SSB. And so that's where I started my working life. So that's where you got the banking bag? Absolutely, that's where I got the banking bag. You know, it's interesting, I got the banking bag in Legon. So we had a session on development finance and um, uh, in, in agricultural economics, and it was really the thing that got me, the whole concept of development finance was really what got me into banking. Mm. So I actually had in a little sentence in a notebook when I was graduating that I wanted to pursue a career in development finance. Wow. And okay. somehow I got into SSB, which was great. You know, and, and you ended up at the desk that was uh, specifically, specifically doing, doing that, banking. yes, development banking. So that's Fantastic where I started stuff. from. Yeah. Right. So uh, you said you grew up in a very large family. Okay. Um, uh, comparatively, you would call that a very traditional setting. Yeah. What was it like? As a child, what were some of the things that you had to do, you know, uh, because in a traditional family, uh, <laughs> Whether you are the, 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 the son of the uh, chief or king, you yeah. still have responsibilities within the household. Absolutely. So, I mean, um, from age five, six, you, you have responsibilities. And um, again, it's, it's very typical. It's, it's not the kind of home where you have dad and mom, you know, because the dad is a chief, so it's everybody's dad. So you That's don't right. have the op opportunity to call anybody a dad and be pumped like daddy's boy, no. So from age six, everybody has a role. And we had a role of 
you know, we had horses, so we would go early in the morning before school to go and harvest fresh grass to come and feed the horses. And uh, we also would, you know, take a broom and sweep around the compound, make sure you bend the trash, and then get ready to go to school. And um, meals were communal affairs. Breakfast, I quite remember, we were never less than eight people around our breakfast bowl, which was always a big bowl of uh, cocoa. And then lunch and or dinner would be a big calabash full of uh, 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 tozafi. Yeah, right, and yeah. then, you know, about eight, sometimes, you know, we during holidays, when our cousins come on holidays, we could swell to around 16 people sitting around a big calabash full of uh, of uh, food like that so and um, yeah so that kind of activity continues and well you know through secondary school you know, looking after your horses looking after the compound going to farm you know and all of this we did barefooted them huh? we were walking barefoot i didn't wear my first sandals until i was going to secondary school wow yes <laughs> so you had responsibility it was like growing up in a military academy quite i tough. like i like yes. the glint in your eye when you <laughs> talked about it i'm sure it's really uh, no i still remember it with a lot of nostalgia <laughs> Uh, yeah. Far from what we have today in terms of our upbringing, we're all very uh, modernized and yeah. uh, we kind of almost have departed from that. And I tell my kids that if I have the opportunity that they have today, I'll be a nuclear scientist. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Yes. You know, but you've turned out to be a fine banker, yeah. you know, sitting at the mm -hmm. uh, top of uh, the tree Absolutely. at uh, Stambic Bank and doing some good work. But we'll get into your professional life mm -hmm. uh, in great detail in yeah. a moment, but before then, what are some of the things that you think you took away from your upbringing that has defined the Al Hassan and Dani we know today? Hard work, hard work, self belief, confidence, you know, right attitude. That's it. Hard work, self belief, you know, the right attitude can do it. You have got to survive. You had to survive. So can you can, pretty can much adapt it. anyway. Yes, pretty much can adapt. You have to listen. You got to take your environment into 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 consideration, and the people around you. You got to be very conscious. Who are they, and what do they mean? You know. So all of that is kind of shaped my view of life. So as a young man out of university, doing your national service, yeah. getting your first taste of real banking yeah. experience, mm -hmm. um, did you think that at that point it was everything you wanted it to be? I think uh, for me, and, and I, I have this philosophy I, I, within the working life, I later call 10, 10, 10, and we'll get to it. But for me, the first few years of SSB was all learning. I, I probably learned in SSB more than I even learned my first degree. So I, I love development finance. And when I got in there, thank God there were some great people, you know, who were in there doing great jobs. I used, literally used to take their feasibility reports home to, to study. And uh, there was this book. We had a library. There was, we had a librarian called Mr. Yankee. I, honestly, I don't know where he is, but um, God bless him. He uh, made all the books available. There was a book called uh, Paul, by Paul Gittinger, Project Analysis. And I literally read that book back page to page. And the good thing about development finance is that you see all the, the soft issues around retail banking and you see all the hard issues around advisory work and project finance, you know. And for me, all those years was all work, was just learning. Money was not my... I, I, if you actually ask me how much were you paid my first check, I honestly don't know. There's the privilege to be there and to learn. It was like what carried me through my first five, six years of the bank. Wow. Yes. Now, you've had a taste of banking. You've stayed in banking for just over three decades. I have almost got into That's frightening, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I think if yeah. you look back, um, you know, we can all attest to the fact that you've held some really great positions. Yeah. Um, you did work with uh, Barclays yeah. at some point. Mm, mm, um, mm. But, but essentially, you've demonstrated in, in this short period, in yeah. the story you've told, that learning was very important for you. Learning was absolutely important. Well, what are some of the things that you would say that, say, in the last three decades, yeah. in terms of the landscape, the financial uh, uh, industry yeah. and the landscape, mm -hmm. how has it evolved over the, the, the three decades? I think it's uh, evolved significantly, you know, and, and again, whether you're talking the complexity of um, the products that financial institutions have to provide, the kind of collaborations, because probably if you roll the, back, the, the clock back 30 years, it was just banks. 
banks were the only uh, game in town. Mm -hmm. But if you roll the clock today, you have a lot more things than banks that do financial services. So the complexity of that offering and how you collaborate to ensure that you are servicing your clients properly. Mm -hmm. And digitization was in there. Everything was paper-based. You know, everything now is on digital basis. Clients came to you, so we're very passive bankers, where client customers came to you with their problems. Now we're literally actually defining the client, defining the solution and getting there to the client. So it's just a sea change. Mm -hmm. and, and that's where the whole concept of learning doesn't stop the innovation because your customers have become a lot more sophisticated, their needs have become a lot more diverse and also the collaboration to even service one particular need is not just in the ambit of one particular service provider. So what kind of structures do you set up to ensure that your service offering is total, to ensure that you are in tandem, in step with the very rapidly changing needs of the client and, and look again, roll the clock by 30 years, the level of global integration of Ghana was pretty low. Mm -hmm. Now we're highly globally integrated, whether it's in companies, products, people, skills, technology. So all of those complexities have now come to influence what it takes to run you know, or provide financial services. So essentially, um, learning is critical. To, learning to, to never making, stops. Okay. If the day you stop, you probably have to... Um, <laughs> That's the day you're yeah, gone. Absolutely. Right. So yeah. in, in, in the scheme of things, yeah. how important, if you'd rate the critical success factors for any business or an individual, mm. where will you place learning amongst other things? Number one, number two, number three, learning. You know, I would say that, you see, the way I... And I'm coming back to my 30-30 uh, skill, you know, that when you start in a work, in the first 10 years of that profession, you've got to stand out in the top 3% in terms of technical competence. So apply yourself to learn it inside out. And uh, so there are two things, learning and interpersonal skills. Whatever you learn, you've got to show the example of it in doing things. And you do things with and through people. So there's learning. There's technical competence and the interpersonal skills. Right. So I try to balance that. And I, my, when I look back, you know, I s could see that I probably spent 90% of my time learning in the first probably five, 10 years of my career. And probably 10% interpersonal skills. Just, you know, having an attitude that got your seniors to want you to do, do stuff for them, you know, and, and to, to be the person that they will, the, the go-to person if they needed some real good technical work to be done. Okay, and then you transition to the middle. Of course, if you do the learning and the bit of interpersonal skills and stand out as a very great technical person within your skill set and within the profession you choose, you get promoted into some kind of managerial supervisory role. Mm -hmm. Again, the learning doesn't stop, it continues. But there you got to blend a lot more and that's still learning interpersonal skills because now in the middle 10 years, you're probably supervising people, you're having a lot more things done through people and people come to you as a referral point. So you still have to retain a decent dose of technical competence, 60% to carry you through, but a lot more interpersonal skills now, probably 40%. Okay, and then if God, uh, the, the mother luck shines on you and you get, you get kicked up as a leader, at that point in time it's probably 90% interpersonal skills and 10% looking more at the technical skills. Because, you know, at that point people probably better than you are doing the technical skills. Mm -hmm. And then you are now just trying to hold together those interpersonal relationships that makes your organization work, that makes it work with customers, with other uh, stakeholders, regulators, and you know, that whole ambit, that industry that you belong to. You know, as a leader, then you need a more accentuated level of interpersonal skills mm. to keep that kind of organization running. Watching us on the Executive Lounge, and my guest today is uh, Mr. Al Hassan Andani, is the CEO of Stambik Bank Ghana. Now, a lot has already been said and there's a lot more for us to explore. We're going to take a short break and when we come back, we'll continue to learn some more. Welcome back to the Executive Lounge with me in Shira Addo. And today I'm joined by the CEO of Stambik Bank Ghana Limited in the pressing of Mr. Al Hassan and Dani. Now, before we went for the break, we learned something very interesting, the 10-10-10 principle. Now, it's a span of 30, but you break it in 10, three lots of 10. 
Uh, the first 10 years of your career, you build your technical competence 90% of the time. And you try to balance it with good interpersonal skills. In the second 20, you increase your interpersonal skills to about 40 and go down on technical competence. But if you're lucky, and by your third 10, you are at a point where you're running the business at the top or you're in senior management, then you need to do more interpersonal skills up to about 90% and 10% of the technical skills uh, because you would have people who are doing that for you. And that leads me to the next set of questions. What's the secret? Is there a formula or something that helps you build a great team? Um, it's not a secret formula. It's a very deliberate formula. It's a very deliberate, um, it's a very deliberate effort. Uh, first of all, you set up a business to live literally in perpetuity. Mm -hmm. So, and, and I always say that the construct of the company, it's, it's uh, literally can almost mimic the construct of the human being. The great thing about the company is that whilst the various, take the human being as pair parts, and we are, and ultimately we just burn out, right? right? So you all start by the time you are eating, every organ is firing at top speed, mm -hmm. isn't it? And, and then you continue and then you start to, right? That's the human being. The company is exactly like that. It has a life. And, but the good thing is that the company can replace its parts True. with even better parts. So the company will start with the founder who has a certain vision. And he, I mean, that vision solves a problem. And that continuity of it is for whoever comes to lead it from the visionary founder to ensure that that vision and the solution that is provided to the, the, the world or the local community is constantly researched and made relevant. So the, 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 the life of the company is the relevance of the peculiar solution that company provides. Mm. So if at any point in time your, your, your solution, product or service is no, no longer relevant, then your company dies. Okay? So for all the companies that have lived 500 years, 300 years, or those that have fallen aside, look at it, and yeah, it's like that. So you've got to have a reason that of the company. What problem? What are you solving? What problem humanity are you solving? Product or service? And how are you constantly researching it to make that solution or product better, you know, and relevant? Mm. And that actually spells the continuity of your product. And then you got to now deliberate it position people who have that thought leadership, who are holding that big vision and growing it. That's your leadership core. And you've got to put them through the right paces of training. And you'll have the technical people, the dexterous people who are actually at it, delivering the product. They need all the technical training, the innovation, the product, the tools. So again, you're, you're positioning another set of people there to carry that through. Mm -hmm. And of course, you'll have the larger support services. Every company will have a set of support services. And usually those support services are common to all companies. Whether you're running a nuclear science lab or you're running a medical facility, you need a good accountant, you need a good human resource person, you need a good ops person, those kind of support structures. you know. So you would deliberately look at what is it that gives my company continuity? What is it that gives my product relevance? And then positioning your human resource people, you know, and structure into it and mm. train to keep that going. You painted a very interesting picture, obviously starting with a leadership core and growing out to your support services. Yeah. These are different people, different individuals, different backgrounds. Yeah. How do you get them to follow a singular purpose with the same level of passion? Um, well, if you got everybody to follow with the same level of passion, that would be great, but it hardly achieved. Mm. Get a critical mass agreed to follow the vision and the same level, but it's like the train. You know, the, the, there has to be a head that drives it in the right direction. You pull everybody along, okay? But they must be going through purposefully. And you must also constantly be assessing this company and saying that I have the right people on the bus. Mm. because. It may just get to some t point in time, some people just have lost it. So they are no longer on your bus. And should you crowd the bus with people who are not on it? So companies like even the human being has a way of, 
you know, taking out and detoxing those and everyone's detoxing hour. every <laughs> nine, every nine, making sure that everybody who is there has the potential, if it's not a passionate believer in the vision, but has some attitude to move towards there. And then constantly growing that, you know, forward looking, visionary energy, passionate people, and then finding a way to replace those need probably other challenges. Mm. You know, you probably may get into a job that's not really your challenge. And, and, um, you know, sometimes it was a probably this is not yours and get the person off the bus. That's not the end of life. Sure. You find something where he or she can shine. So you've got to have a very rigorous process of reviewing who is, who is imbibing the vision, who is driving it, who is making it grow, supporting it, rewarding all those people, training them constantly. And as nature would always have it, there will be some who get tired and probably want to change. There's some who just don't match up to the standards you set, and you have to have difficult conversations. That's all part of the leadership ethos, and, and also part of keeping that corporate refreshed and growing in strength. Is banking as high octane as, say, um, the media space, for example? <laughs> I'm sure if you asked everybody in whichever industry, they would say theirs was the highest octane. Uh, but I think banking is, I mean, is high octane in the sense that you hardly, ex you know, there's no formula to what you expect the next day because it's a customer experience mm -hmm. that you're trying to give. And that experience is unique from hour to hour, day to day. So that gives you that high octane thing because your client is sitting in front of you, he has some expectations today. It's not the same expectation you repeat every hour, every day. So literally, um, you, you, you just have to be at your fingers, I mean, your, you know, on your toes, on your toes all, all the, the time. time. So that probably makes it out. And also, especially for what is service industry, mm -hmm. it's typically high octane because there is, there is the production of the service is happening right in front of the consumer. Yeah. So you haven't got a second chance to make a good first impression. That makes it high octane. It's not like producing a laptop or a car. If you, if you see a brand new Mercedes-Benz in a factory, you're likely to say, wow, this is a fantastic product. But if you trace that Mercedes-Benz back to where the bolts and nuts were put together, it's not pretty. And, and the customer doesn't see that. That's right. But in the service industry, in banking, it's the, right there. It's right you're, there. You're, you're there. Putting the bolts and nuts and the attitude, the way you breathe, the way you, you smile or not smile, the way you throw your hands around, all of that is going into the evaluation of the product. Mm -hmm. It's going to the evaluation yeah. of the product. Okay. So that really makes it high octane. It's happening, the production, the sales, everything is happening right in front of the, the consumer. Interesting you say that. I'd like to explore the concept of getting a critical mass to follow the vision yeah. in the face of customer expectations that's rapidly changing. Mm -hmm. And I'm borrowing from the experience you shared from your days at SG, mm. uh, uh, SSB at mm. the time. Mm. Um, everything was very manual, paper, no automation, but to a point where today there's a lot of machine to machine um, communications mm. going on. Mm. Mm. Uh, technology is at the center of everything that we do. At what level must a leader function to get the spirit of innovation going and what do you look for in the people who will be able to help you achieve that level of innovation that keeps the relevance you've had from the beginning so uh, the point i made about having pro uh, companies that will survive is about having a product and service that's relevant and in this very high paced uh, evolution of humankind mm -hmm. with 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 what I call the, the use of ether, which is a GSM and everything is instant. Yeah. The leader of today has to be hardcore innovation driven because that is the only way your product and your service will stay relevant. And therefore, you know, you have to hire, and again, um, so if I'm, am I going to hire people who were like SSB those days? No. I'm going to hire very different people now because the people who take this company forward or anybody leading the company now knows that, look, um, going forward, the kind of thinking that needs to run your company, whether you're in media or banking, whatever, it's going to, even medicine, it's going to be a very different set of people who have deep appreciation 
of ICT who have a deep appreciation of you know the instant gratification of your customers. Mm -hmm. Everything you do today is on the net, and people are reacting to it. So, uh, a passenger is being yanked off uh, United, uh, and whilst and it's, it's happening, all over the place. it's on the place. So, as a leader, how do you react to that? So, you you got to be innovative for, all, and you know you have a product that is out there, and again, social media is applauding it. How do you immediately react to it? So, all of that, you got to be innovation aware. You got to be very progressive and have people and systems around you that is feeding that quickly and you facilitating it. So in 2014, yeah. uh, Stambic launched the Money Wallet, yes. which allows yes. you to uh, essentially have the, the one wallet on one card, but four different currencies. This afternoon, I just finished a discussion where I'm adding a fifth currency, which is a Ghana CD. You're adding a fit to the Money Wallet. Yes. Okay, so that's innovation yes. over a period of three years. Yes. Fantastic. You don't always get it right with innovation. Yes. And in the period where sometimes it doesn't go well, mm. share with us some insights on how you take an innovation that didn't do too well and say, okay, we've learned A, B, and C, and we take it to the next level yes. Yes. without permanently denting the image of the brand. It's called feel fast. It's a, con it's a concept called feel fast. Mm -hmm. If you innovate and it's succeeding, you're constantly learning. If it is not, you fail fast. Pick up the lessons and go to the very next thing. Don't tarry, because if you tarry, then the failure is deepened and it impacts your customers, impacts the, cust the confidence of your staff. Mm -hmm. So fail fast. If, if you start something and it's working, keep taking the positive feedback and keep improving it. If it's not working, drop it quickly and replace and it with something else. One. So feel fast. Let's talk about, um, in terms of the brand, and sometimes you don't always wake up to the best of news. Yeah. How did you react to the pressure of the incident that had a contract staff um, essentially um, committing some malfeasance? Yeah. First of all, when you found out, what did you first think and what steps did you take to ensure that your brand didn't suffer irreparable damage? My first reaction and concern was for my customers. First of all, to reach out to as many of them as possible, to let them understand the particular situation that arose. Own it and say that this thing happened in my premises, but this is the, my, my universe of customers, this is my universe of the promise, this is the general state of the promise, is this a localized situation? Yes, can I deal with it? Yes. Number one was my customers. How do we assure my customers that, you know, in the general promise that the bank had made to them, that promise holds perfectly, mm -hmm. and this is just an aberration. Okay. So that was my first. Number two was my regulator. A regulator to ensure that the integrity of what we do holes and of course then get in quickly to see you know we've got processes and procedures in the in the bank that's what we as leaders have responsibility for mm -hmm. and that's why it doesn't matter whether it happens in Borga or it happens in coming to one you as a leader you are responsible why because the processes and procedures that governs everything were pre-taught taught about laid down you know you put people to supervise that so I go back and then start to interrogate those processes and procedures that mm -hmm. were put down to say where did the cracks come from can I quickly patch can I remodel and all of that and then of course deal with the nucleus problem with the nucleus problem was try and reach out to as many people as possible who were impacted and to see how they could help us understand the process breaches that that happened and restitution mm. So you go through, you know, number one, my, my reason that trace to my customers. So take that whole universe of promise I've made to my customers and try to reassure them that that promise remains, you know, solidly uh, supported and they can identify it. And let them, they themselves make the judgment that this is a localized mm -hmm. uh, situation. And, and I need to work hard on it. Right. Number two, as I said, I'm a regulated institution. My regulator has to understand that my processes work. And that this, again, was a localized situation. Then number three was, of course, I'm the custodian of the processes and procedures that work or should work so that things like that don't happen. Mm -hmm. So I have to go back and now get people to integrate those processes and procedures to see where did those processes go wrong. And, of course, deal with the localized situation. In dealing with the localized situation, you are learning to see how did those happenings, you know. And again, okay, it goes and back into your future 
client management, client education, and stuff like that. So, Wonderful. Yeah. Great stuff. So in a moment, um, I would like to learn a little more about innovation. Mm. Um, you talked about adding a fit currency to the money wallet. Yeah. Uh, recently, you've uh, had, you, you, you tend to do this uh, hackathons or app challenge, yes, right? app challenge. Yeah. I love that. <laughs> Stambic seems to, to embrace technology yeah. and you drive technology. Mm -hmm. Where do you see financial technology evolving uh, or how is it likely to evolve in the next few years? I think at the rate at which we are going, my sense is that in the next 10, 15 years, if you told somebody you are going to a bank, he might ask, where is that? He might ask, what are you going to do there? We, we, we are evolving so quickly that Literally, everything that we're supposed to be doing in a banking hall will now be in the palm of our clients. That's our objective. So it started off to say, oh, you don't need to come and queue behind a, a cashier mm -hmm. to take cash. Go to an ATM. Then it said, oh, you don't need to come to a cashier to, to find your bank balance. Go to the ATM. So we started to kind of strip. We're stripping, you know, little things that happen in the banking hall and putting it on platforms. Mm -hmm. Let, now we're taking everything that happens in the banking hall and putting it on platforms. Sometimes, you know, and other markets have gotten to that already, we are in collaboration with everybody else, merchants, uh, supermarkets. So if you need a cash, you didn't need to come to the bank. Mm -hmm. You just go and give your card to the supermarket. And, and they'll give you your cash back. And they'll give you a cash back and then you're going with your card. If you, if you needed to pay anybody, locally, internationally, within exchange control, your card, your laptop, it's done. Instructions come into work because the sanctity of banking is your unique identity as an individual or a corporate. And therefore, your unique identity, you come and give us a mandate. Which mandate says that if you see these instructions supported by that and that is coming from me, deal. So we are now able to put the sanctity of that mandate onto platforms with the adequate safeguards to enable you to deal with that in, in, wherever you are. So when we have achieved all of this, do we still need brick and mortar? That's tough, okay? You know, there will still be financial services, a deep science, mm -hmm. it's a deep science, you know, and a lot of collaboration. So we'll still do the higher, what I, call, what I would say, knowledge-based advisory work mm. with clients. But would we do that in a location or can we chit-chat on your platform, wherever you are, now even the U.S.? You know, you need legal advice, you go to some website and you can literally get legal advice to go and confront the judge mm -hmm. on your particular case. I would get going into that in, in banking, where if I'm thinking of a big major, um, major acquisition or some big transaction, big innovative deal, can I just come straight, identify myself positively on a laptop, sit with my investment banker, and all the issues are sorted out, I don't need to visit him. So technology so is going to play a very key role. Technology is going to move this whole banking onto, onto people's how do you How do you juxtapose that against the um, fact that at the moment we have very few banked population? Yeah. And statistics indicate that under 25% of our population are educated, mm -hmm. uh, which would mean that technology may be a barrier. Yeah. Do you see that penetration still on the up? I significantly on the up. In fact, we are leapfrogging. We are leapfrogging education. We are leapfrogging uh, because look at the GSM, right? Your people sitting, whether they speak English or don't speak English, can communicate on GSM. Mm -hmm. And so long as people can communicate and be understood, if you don't want to become irrelevant, then you have to reduce or put your services on the platform that people understand. So if it is that somebody is sitting somewhere, he can only speak a particular language and needs to move cash, how do I transform, how do I transform my services into that language the person can understand? So for you, that so, conundrum is an opportunity. It's a huge opportunity. Wonderful. We'll be exploring some more opportunities in a moment. This is the Executive Lounge with me and Girardo. We're going to take a moment. When we come back, we'll continue to learn more from Mr. Alassan Andani, CEO of Stampic Bank Ghana Limited. Welcome back to the Executive Lounge. My name is Inshira Addo, and my guest today 
is Mr. Al Hassan Andani. He's the CEO of Stambic Bank Ghana Limited. We've learned quite a lot already, and I urge you to make sure you catch this on the YouTube channel if you missed it. Uh, so if you just joined us, we're in the final leg of the conversation. And we're about to learn a number of other things about Mr. Andani and the industry he works in. I'm very curious, for the size of our nation, the size of our economy, we have just as many banks as we have. The situation is as though we have in the media space. Uh, lots of banks, um, but we have a small unbanked population. The two schools of thought, one say, let's consolidate. Mm -hmm. The other says, in consolidating, we'll end up muscling out local players. What's your take on the two schools? Uh, let, let's, let's get your appraisal of them. So I, I would look at it from three angles. Number one is the um, stage of the economy. Just to understand why they're attached to 233 banks. The economy is emerging. It's still not a modern economy. It's, um, so there, there, it, it means that there's still a lot of fragmentation in the market. And, and that fragmentation means that certain banks can appeal to niche customers. And, and survive, but that's only for a while, because sooner or later, so for example, you have some banks, just go into the market, you see base rates of banks, from 32% to 16%. Where in the world can you see that spread of base rate? Of literally double, mm -hmm. but it's because the market is so fragmented. In the modern evolution of the market, you have some SME that is prepared to go and borrow money at 6% per month. Mm -hmm. You have a corporate body who says, I wouldn't even borrow at 8% per annum. So because of the fragmentation, different segments and different client needs are satisfied by this myriad of banks. Mm. That's number one. Sooner or later, the economy and the pace at which we are going will grow. And people will look over their, their shoulders and say, no, I wouldn't do this. Or this is not good for me. And then you tend to find out that the kind of solutions the banks are providing are now converging. Mm. In this fragmented market, the solutions we are providing are not converging. When, but when the economy develops to where there's a lot more modernized use of financial services, you'd see that the services the banks are providing are converging. Mm -hmm. So when it's converging, the people go to the superior values. And therefore, your more advanced banks will win and the lower ones will start to drop. Now, consolidation. Uh, and, and the argument around uh, uh, local banks being, uh, local entrepreneurs being muzzled out, it's not quite the case. I can count on my fingers about 10, 15 local banks who are owned by indigenous Ghanaians. If you put the capital of those 10 banks together, they could come together and create one bank in one fell soup in terms of capital bigger than Barclays, bigger than Stanchard, even bigger than Ecobank. If those, the capital that all these local indigenous people have spread into their banks, and for confidentiality purposes, not mention them, mm -hmm. but if we looked at all those 12 local banks, if they put all that capital together under one uh, big leadership, they'll have a bank bigger than Ecobank. Would consolidation muzzle out local uh, entrepreneurs? No. The other piece of, and, the, and I was sharing with you the issue around APSA. APSA mm -hmm. is the amalgam, it's called the Amalgamated Banks of South Africa. So it started with the amalgamation of local South African banks. Today, it's a monstrous organization in South Africa, and it's global. So we have to, there are lessons out there for us to learn. So, so, so the, the whole, for, for the lack of a better expression, the... You know, the, my small tabletop for me and my family, yes. if we stepped out of that zone yeah. and started pooling our resources together, exactly. we probably could start having banks that would go global. Absolutely. And, and, and this can be replicated that across can be replicated, yeah. other industries. Yes. Very well, interesting yeah. stuff there. Yes. Would you consider yourself a philosopher? <laughs> I, I, love, I love philosophy, but I, I, you know, there's something between a theorist, a philosopher, and a leader. So I, I, I like to call myself a, bank, a business leader. You know, I have philosophical ideals that I try to make an example of. And that, is, that puts you in the arena of, of leadership. Okay. Yeah. Now some of the, uh, the, the, the stuff you talked about uh, in terms of when you were growing up, uh, self-confidence, uh, the issue of uh, hard work. Hard work yeah. uh, what other ideals as you're 
evolving as a person have you found useful along the way? It's just the uniqueness of people and the skills that they have. You know, um, if, if you focus, and, and also I've just come to realize that you can't lead people when you don't like them. You have to like people intensely in order to provide them good leadership. So for me, it's, it's and when I look back, and it's a big family, so you see the, the, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And it teaches you the human you know, behavior. Mm -hmm. and you, can, you have the advantage to distill you know, those ideals. You know, so people were patient, forgiving, tolerant, you know, sharing, caring, those kind of people, you, even that big family, they survived. Mm -hmm. Those who were very militant, would not give an inch, you know, you look at it, so you, you almost have a spectrum to be able to see what success looks like. And you bring it into life and you can see it. Would you agree that uh, quite possibly growing up in a large family mm. and observing all these different individuals and the complexities it presented probably put you in a good stead to be running Stambic Bank today? I would absolutely say so because um, you, you just have that complexity of people, you are working to people at the head office, you are working with a large com com people in the company who have immediate needs like you, you are dealing with a regulator. If you don't see value in everything that people do around you, you can't operate. Everybody around you must be valuable and valued. And, and for me, coming from where I came from, I valued everything. Mm. Anybody who put a shade over me um, is very much appreciated. I didn't take anything for granted. How do you show that a person is valued in the kind of an organization you work in terms of the size? Yeah. Because you're spread right across the country. Yeah. Um, and you can only be in one place at one. But you have to have conversations. You, you know, um, there, there are structures to manage the person I care, because the person comes to work with his personal ambitions mm -hmm. and how to imbibe the ambitions of the organization. So you can't ignore the personal ambitions of the person. So we have structures, again, as I said, as leaders, we are responsible for those structures. That is able to actually have individual conversations with everybody that works in the organization to say, what are your personal ambitions? Mm -hmm. And how are you coping with the ambitions of the institution? How can we help yours? get better? How can you help the organization get better? We are having those conversations constantly. That we are having. Sounds like a lot of work, but you seem excited talking oh, no, about it's, it. It's a lot of work, but you have a great team that behind it and doing it and feeding it up and you stepping in front of them and having conversations. Mm. And for me, you know, you should, one of the things is accessibility. I try to make myself accessible to everybody. You know, and sometimes you just listen very carefully and what you've heard from this person, if we test it out, it's not just a unique complaint. So you don't probably need to touch everybody. Just listen to three, three people within a particular work segment and you see the pain points of those people. If we distill it, it's as though you spoke to everybody in that area. So by fixing so by whatever fixing, there, you touch a lot of other people. Lot of people. Mm, so make yourself accessible and then... As a business leader and as you rise, you become even more noticeable, not just in the space you operate, but also uh, in political leadership because you're contributing to um, the growth of a nation and its development. Um, how can business interface with politics um, so that both thrive very well? Um, look, I think uh, there's a lot of interface. One is business is the one that carries out policy. So policy is basically what government does. Government is supposed to drive whether economic policy, security, would think about it. It's businesses that work with it. Mm -hmm. And we should honestly give feedback on how it works or doesn't work. And, and that's what we do. And again, I'm a great believer in part of corporate social responsibility. Instead of giving money, is to give time and skills of people into public sector. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you need, if you have challenges with budget control, if you have challenges with human resource management, you are, and we, because we are smaller, we tend to be a bit more intense in the way we bring up our people. Mm -hmm. And therefore, these people can actually volunteer hours into public uh, work. And again, again, as I said, for me, the, the, where business meets politics is really how business prosecutes policy. Because mm -hmm. I prosecute my business 
within policy, and that policy is established by government. The broader tax policy, the broader macroeconomic policy, these are all things, the exchange control, you know, monetary policy, these are all big government initiatives. How do I position my business to navigate and make it profitable? And what are the challenges? Do I feed that back constantly to, 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 to business, to, to government? And if I were government, I'd be very interested in what private sector people do, because they, they really take my uh, natural resources, my people, mm -hmm. and deploy them, and they allocate those resources. i like to know how they're locating them. You know, what conversation do you have with the biggest taxpayers, and what can you do to facilitate it? Because the more tax I pay, the more revenue you have to run your, mm -hmm. your state. So there's, there's a happy, you know, uh, uh, marriage between, uh, or could be, could be, there could be a very good marriage between business and, and, and politics. Mm -hmm. But again, politics is evolving in our parts of the world. You just have to be you know, careful that you, know, you do what is in the interest of national development and not in any parochial political interest. Where, where you find yourself um, sitting, for example, as, as uh, chairman of the um, Savannah Accelerated Development CRC, um, yeah. uh, uh, Authority Board, yeah. It's, it's former, a very public, form, former, chairman. former, yes, <laughs> former chairman, that's right. It's a very public position. Yeah. Um, and as you did say, mm -hmm. rightly, our politics is evolving. Yeah. So um, sometimes a spotlight will be thrown on you because of that position. And you occupy a business leadership position. Yeah. And this sometimes also is perceived, mm. uh, or the appointing authority is a political authority. Yeah. How are you able to ensure that the brand you've created for yeah. yourself yeah. is not affected by some of the challenges that occupying a public space like that bring. Yeah. So I think if if you left this decision to the owners of the the private businesses we run, your the owners would rather tell you not to get involved with the public mm -hmm. sector. They will not. And and that's number one. But number two, they also are conscious of the fact that you work in a broader economy. And therefore, they'll try and do some big of background check to see whether whatever you do in the public sector mm -hmm. will impact adversely on what you do, you are, you are able to do in the private sector and vice versa. And then give you a, a heads up to either take the role or not take the role. But having said that, it's a very difficult, you know, terrain to operate, especially in a highly polarized, mm -hmm. you know, you know, political environment, you know, where everything is judged on a political basis. No decision is judged on the merit of the decision. So it's quite a challenge. And, and, and I might say that, you know, yeah, a lot of lessons learned. And, you know, um, again, as I said, it's always a learning yeah. uh, uh, process. Share some of your learnings with us, uh, especially the things you've learned when you've had your fingers burned. Because on a journey like this, you will make mistakes. Oh, yeah. um, what are some of the lessons that you will take away from some of these um, situations? Um, lots of them, lots of them. The thing is about, they say, fall down seven times and get up eight times, mm -hmm. you know. Um, that, that's the whole point, you know, and that you couldn't do all these things without mistakes. I, I think the biggest mistake I made was, I, I, I did have a collaboration with the Ghana Private Road Transport Union. Because uh, in 2008, 2009, when I did the analysis of the transport sector, it was contributing quite a sizable chunk to the GDP. And yet, if we looked at the transport sector, whether it was intercity buses, local buses, literally out of every 10 buses that were running in Ghana, probably only one or two were new. Mm -hmm. Everything else were Euro car cars, 10 years old vehicles. So I, I, I had this grand idea to work with the GPR to you to replace their fleet of vehicles with brand new vehicles in the city, intra city, to work with them to clean up their stations, mm -hmm. you know, take away all the clutter and build it nicely, have quarters for their drivers, work with them along their routes to improve their stopping, uh, their rest stops, look at their fuel supply, have a collaboration with Goyle, mm -hmm. you know, to kind of give them an offtake. Sounds like a bank. really grand Fantastic vision. Fantastic idea. And then um, I worked with GPR that I studied it not just overnight. Three years, I followed them until I thought I had understood and brought them along. 
and then we incepted the project. We're looking to spend about $20 million on wow. that whole project. We, we, our first investment was $8 million, $10 million. And in six months, the results were disastrous. Six months, brand new vehicles, Ghanaian transporters refused to pay. Wow. Yeah, and in six months, we ran into defaults. It was shocking. It's something I still can't get my head around. What was a key lesson from that for you? The key lessons for me, again, is always people and the intentions of people and leaders and the intentions of leaders. Unfortunately, I always say that leaders that have immediate self-gratification are not leaders. In any situation, if you have a leader and you are just looking at the immediate for your own gratification, uh, and I give you an example. So the, we worked. We had to work through the leadership of this organization. Mm. And, you know, some of the defaults that you and we, we we tried to get them to spread this benefit to everybody that they were leading because the transport owners wanted. You know, you understand. So they so found out to the base. People's yeah. IDs and gave them the vehicles based on their own individual IDs. Mm -hmm. Then when the default happened, you realize that no, sorry, all those people who took these vehicles were for the leader, really. So again, do you impose your interests as a leader over people, or you allow people who you are leading to grow and grow sometimes above you? Uh, it was very interesting. It was just a lesson in human behavior yeah. and how human beings behave when you. I'm sure it's put you in good stead because um, yeah. <laughs> it's kept you going. Yeah. Now. Um, Let's get to know what you do or to relax. When, when, when you're not uh, monitoring financial you know, numbers and thinking of great ideas for yeah, the bank, yeah. what do you do to relax? I like to read. I like to read. I like conversations. So I'm, I'm not, I'm, I like to converse and I'm blessed. So usually weekends I'll have friends and family and I like to sit with them and debate all sorts of issues. That's what I do for entertainment. I, I like to relax. Unfortunately, I don't do films. I don't do uh, any kind of uh, outdoor entertainment. I used to play golf, but I haven't been on the golf course for a while. So reading, quiet moments, reflection, conversations. Wonderful. Yeah. Well, I must say, it's been a very insightful <laughs> conversation with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. This has been the Executive Lounge, and as always, we end with uh, five things that I have picked from the conversation so far. Uh, it is important that you have self-confidence and, uh, uh, and learn to work hard. So hard work, self-confidence, and if you're going to fail, which you will do at some point in life, fail fast. Don't let the failure tarry for so long that it creates inertia, and also, Learn to do things in tens. So break it up so that you can learn and learn. Ten, ten, ten. Simply put or explained that your first ten years of your career should be about becoming astute technically. And 10% of your time should also be used to learn how to build interpersonal skills. And then you increase your interpersonal skills to 40. And then eventually you increase that to 90. But remember, it's 10, 10, 10. The final thing is that you ought to learn. Learn from everything. Learn from people, learn from situations, learn from written material. Learn, learn, learn. Again, thank you so much. Thank you very much. I've enjoyed myself. This thank has you. been the Executive Lounge with me and Shira Addo. And uh, we're grateful to the folk at Villa Monticello for providing us the set. And thanks to the crew and producer, Kukwa Apia. Au revoir for now. We'll be back. Go forward, make rain. Shalom. Is this something you learned? Were you born an entrepreneur? You've got to start small. I have not allowed being a woman to hold me back. Credibility is not just making money. It's about making sure that you know people trust what you're doing. Law practice is not only about going to court. It's about advice. It's very difficult to, to hire somebody who's not motivated and then make them motivated. One of the things that I'm known for is integrity. They have to see you as a person of integrity. Right. <laughs> Welcome to the Executive Lounge. I'm Inshira Adam.